Hello everyone. It's great to be here today. According to most studies, people's number one fear is public speaking. Number two is death. Death is number two. Does that sound right? This means to the average person, if you go to a funeral, you're better off in the casket than doing the eulogy. Wow, Jerry Seinfeld said that. Can you believe it? I could have never imagined that public speaking would be deemed the worst thing in the world for people. Holy moly. Look at that. Chapman University has conducted some research on it as well. Let's have a look. People are afraid of tight spaces, vaccines, clowns, and public speaking. <laughs> Ain't that crazy? Nothing is impossible, y'all. Let's wipe that prefix from that word. In fact, it doesn't matter if you're shy or extroverted. If you feel you can do it, we'll see that it's not about that. Everyone can deliver a great talk, provided we cover some key aspects beforehand. First thing we need to be aware of is that we live in a dual reality world. Things could be impossible in the objective world out there, physically speaking, like fighting gravity, flying by flapping your arms, right? But for our ideas and for beliefs and stories, nothing is truly impossible. You can be whoever you want to be, provided you have one key ingredient. This is what's great about us humans. We have two realities we live in, and the subjective reality is open for us to explore and to model it the way we want it to, thanks to a special thing we're going to be discussing about. And from what I gather, there's one thing that all presentations, talks, workshops, lectures, there's one thing that they have in common. What is it? Tell me, please. <laughs> Just kidding. It's good to stir up curiosity and to have this suspense in the air, right? But like I said, there's one thing that all great talks have in common, and I'd like to share that with y'all. Your number one mission as a speaker is to transfer into your listeners' minds, whether students or fellow teachers, an extraordinary gift, an idea. An idea is the single most powerful device known to us humans. Everything you see in the world, everything you see in ELT, in language learning, in academics, started out as an idea in someone else's mind. They were able to communicate it in a way that made it become reality. Teachers must communicate ideas in a way that compels students to take action, or your idea will just die out in limbo. It'll be totally forgotten by everyone. And the classroom is the perfect environment for ideas to be brought to life and for them to be spread, just like a lecture, you know? We're talking about ideas worth spreading. The same works anywhere, anyhow. And we're talking about public speaking sessions, right? So we definitely need to say it, but we need to say it better. We need to tell a story. We need to tell a story that encompasses a very specific human trait. The fact that we live in a dual reality. You're special. I'm special. Our student is special. The audience is special. This mantra is actually part of this dual reality, meaning we only believe that we're special because we happen to share a common trait, which is the power to believe in fictional stories. And this cannot be taken for granted. If you're going to be a speaker, if you're going to share ideas with people, you need to tell them stories. You need to share knowledge using the common structure of storytelling. Stories and ideas are much more powerful than anything else because it doesn't act on an individual level. It acts on a collective level. It makes people do things. It is a call to action. A great idea that's shared to other people will make humans cooperate flexibly and in very large numbers. Bees in beehives, they can't cooperate just like us. They can, but their cooperation is very rigid. I don't need to know you personally for us to cooperate, for us to live in society. 
And again, this happens because we all believe in the notion of nations, countries, cities, teachers, education, human rights, you name it. But what enables us to cooperate in such a way? What enables us? The answer is our imagination does. If we believe that there's a standard variation of a language and that is better than all other variations out there, then it becomes the ultimate truth. It's shared knowledge. We'll cooperate towards using it and enforcing it to others so they can believe it the same way we do. If we think that learning a language is important, we want to share that with others, right? If I want to convince someone that English is the most important language in the world, or maybe that is not the most important language, whatever, maybe that learning English will be an asset to that person's professional and academic life, then I need to be aware that they will believe it. If it works, as a story does. If it's shared, if they can share this idea, it becomes shared knowledge, which seems to be intuitive, but in fact, it is something socially acquired. Depending, <clears throat> depending on various factors that I'm not going to touch here. So, we use language to describe realities, to create new realities, to imagine possible worlds, to envision future outcomes. I'm assuming that, as a teacher, you like to communicate your ideas effectively. There's a way to do so, or at least there's a way for us to try and maximize our potential here. All forms of mass-scale human cooperation rely on the simple fact that we all believe in stories, just like I said before. The same will apply for a lecture, for a session, for a lesson. Legal systems, for example, they're based on the idea of human rights. But what are human rights? They're not objective. They're not a biological effect. They are an idea. Same goes for politics with the states and nations. Same goes for economics companies, corporations, they function the same way. What are these things? You know, they're legal fictions. They are the work of powerful wizards, people who have come up with great ideas, and they were able to develop them and spread them successfully. Back to our own situation now. We need to keep the reins. We need the audience to follow what we're saying, to be engaged. Anytime we get an audience that's paying attention, we enjoy it more. So let's look at six ways to hook our audience. But first, let me show you three big no-nos. Three things you don't want to do right on your introduction. Experts say you only have six seconds to make a first impression. In life, we can botch a first impression, but later make up for it, if given enough time. Unfortunately, a speech is typically too short, so if your audience immediately gets a negative impression of you, you may as well sit down. Your introduction should be the most powerful portion of your speech for many reasons. Primarily, your nerves will calm down if you get through the first few minutes successfully. And most importantly, your audience will connect with your material if your introduction is engaging. Having a poor introduction will ensure that your audience dozes off or ignores your speech completely. For some reason, many speeches begin negatively. If we know what doesn't work, if we're terrified of public speaking, we can make changes in our behaviors to at least make a powerful first impression. And here are my three no-nos for speech introductions. Well, these are actually from Alexandra Rister. So she says that first, never, never, ever begin your speech with an apology. Oh, I'm sorry that I'm late. I'm sorry you haven't been feeling well. So I'm sorry if my voice isn't loud. Sorry if I'm not wearing the right clothes. Oh, I'm really nervous. No. Don't be sorry. An apology is a negative thing. An apology is about remorse, regret, sadness, and shame. So why in the world would an audience member want to listen to the rest of your speech if your first few minutes are heavily bogged down in all that negativeness? You know how people don't want to be around a negative person, right? So starting your speech with this bad energy makes people not like you and not want to listen to you. 
If the first thing out of your mouth is negative, you'll have to do much overcompensating to making things positive again. And remember, you only got six seconds to impress people. Don't ramble. Your introduction should be short, attention grabbing, and explain the reason for the speech. Your introduction should also comprise 10% of your overall speech. So it's a, if it's a 45 minute presentation, about five minutes. Rambling may display your nervousness as um, speakers who ramble off and they're trying to shake off their nervous energy. So this might signal to your audience that you're boring or you're unprepared. So forget about that. Don't lose the audience's attention. Um, it's gonna be much better. Okay, cool. Next one. Well, if you look, if you look up on YouTube, lots of TED Talks, you know, they say, do not read the speech. I mean, if you've written one, just try and memorize that one and don't and forget about it. Just wing your presentation. I mean, just rehearse many times and then you're, you're going to do just fine. This, guys, you know, not reading the speech is crucial in your introduction because if you read your speech you're gonna be hiding behind a barrier a physical barrier right I mean your notes written right in front of your face so we can all tell that you're reading a reading voice is just robotic natural voice is much more human okay um, it might it might I'm not sure but people might think that you haven't practiced and lack of practice signals to the audience that Maybe you don't care, maybe you're not an expert, so it's gonna mess up with your credibility. With your credibility. So your introduction, you need to be confident, you need to be assertive, you need to be engaging, okay? Connect with the audience right there. Um, we need a hook, right? We need something to be catchy. Um, it doesn't have to be gimmicky, but it, it's gotta be interesting. It doesn't have to be absurd, but I guarantee you that if you follow these six approaches, the ones that we're talking about, chances are that you're going to be successful. Okay? So first thing is you can open with a shocking you can open it with a shocking statement, something that's important, something like three ways to conceal your farting in public. How to hide your farts? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Like I said, it doesn't have to be gimmicky but you get my point right it, it gets your attention and i used seinfeld's quote about research and the linking of fear of public speaking and death so that was kind of like you know a shocking statement you would never think that people would link public speaking to death so this is a good way to get your audience's attention second thing you need to use a metaphor metaphor is a very powerful tool because we think in metaphor right so uh, I can give you an example um, when Princess Diana died for her eulogy her brother he used a very important metaphor to get his point across and to develop uh, a, a, an emotional link with the audience he said it is a point to remember that all the ironies about Diana, perhaps the greatest, was this. A girl given the name of the ancient goddess of hunting was, in the end, the most hunted person of the modern age. So it's really easy for people to picture the situation here. And you also work with their emotion. So asking your audience a question is a surefire way to get them sucked into your speech right from the start. Okay, you don't have to get answers from from your audience members. Your question could be, in fact, rhetorical. Just maybe a point for future reflection. Something like, why does a teacher decide to become a teacher trainer or a brass diesel speaker? Why do teachers don't like to speak English around other teachers? No, just something in those lines would do. Telling a story is an amazing way to get your audience leaning forward and really listening we always begin with this story structure this narrative speech because telling a good story is crucial if you're going to be a public speaker okay um, it can be anything it can be a personal story it can be a story that will help you develop your topic but it will definitely be inspirational 
And if it's personal, you're going to connect with the audience. That will help with your credibility. <laughs> I cannot say that word for some reason. Credibility. <laughs> now I got it. Um, yeah, so it is, you know, to begin a presentation with a quote is thought provoking. So, I mean, like I said, you know, I use Jerry and Seinfeld. Um, and it makes you, the audience, recall the quote. Think about the original speaker, right? So if the speaker has a good ethos, a good character, that can be transferred to myself as a presenter because I'm aligning myself with that famous quote and that famous presenter, okay? Something else that we got to think about, humor. Humor. Humor is really good. So keep, it, keep this in mind, okay? It is good, but it's not about telling jokes. Your humor should relate to your point, to the main point of your speech. So humor is quite tricky because you don't actually know the entire audience. You don't know if they're going to think it's funny, right? But use it with care. Um, Self-depreciating humor is always best because it allows you to develop your ethos as a presenter. It allows you to connect with the audience to say, hey, we're, re we're, we're equals here. Um, things like that. It's always helpful to view presentations to learn how to be a better presenter, just like this one here. It's a presentation on how to deliver a good presentation. So you can check TED, right? I mean, all the TED Talks on YouTube. You can check Nancy Duarte. She's absolutely great. And most of the stuff that I'm using here is actually from Nancy. Some of the stuff from Alexander Rister and some of the stuff that I'm using is from Chris Anderson and you guys are going to check the references right by the end of the presentation but anyhow we need to think that a presentation a lesson a session will always be a three-legged stool and this concept is really important the first leg of the stool will be content will be the message Nancy Duarte, she explains that this leg includes brainstorming, developing a theme, researching, organizing and structuring, developing an outline, writing stories, considering ethos, pathos, logos, and considering the audience. Your content, your message, is important in a presentation, but it's not the only part of your presentation. Most people, especially um, people who like those PowerPoints with lots of bullet points, they emphasize too much content, but they forget to consider the other legs of this presentation stool. So let's focus on the other legs then. You know, the second leg is visual presentation, visual story, visual cues. So all the visual aids that you have, it, it includes your slides, uh, you can develop a storyboard, you can show diagrams, multimedia, colors, template, images, contrast, graphs, text, proximity, size, shape, fluidity, flow, speed, hierarchy, you name it. There's many things. Just think as a designer. Just think like a designer. You know what he or she would do. Um, so now we got the content and we got the slideshow. Now you may think, well, the presentation's finished, but then there's a third leg, and the third leg is actually the most important one, which is delivery. And most people just forget that this exists because they're so focused on content, they're so focused on the slides, so some of us feel that delivery is the least important leg, but it's extremely important. Um, winging will never really work in terms of delivery. Practice is essential for any presentation, okay? When you think about your lecture, your breast diesel presentation, always think that you have three things to work on, your content, your visuals, and your delivery. Um, there's different types of delivery, right? It's very hard to pinpoint which one is the right one, but three-leg presentation, and three modes of persuasion so content visual aids delivery but then how you do it in a way that what's implicitly there 
is also important and we're going to discuss it as the three modes of presentation um, let me just give you some presentation basics for you all like i said three legs stool content visual aids and delivery content is all about brainstorming researching analyzing your audience but content is also about transforming your presentation into a story so we're going to look at how we can infuse story structure into our presentation as well you also need to decide if you're going to use slides they help you heaps your audience will use every sense they have um, whether it's auditory visual kinesthetic you name it so using visual aids images data graphs working on your layout worrying about colors fonts everything will help present your content in a more organized way things will be neatly presented okay off to the last topic the last topic is delivery which consists of many things the way you prepare yourself how many times you rehearse can you record a podcast for your lecture can you ask for help what's the rhythm what you're gonna wear right what's your attire how much time you need per slide are you gonna establish eye contact with your audience of course you are and everything else but none of this stuff is gonna work if you're not aware of the three modes of presentation sorry the three modes of persuasion <laughs> and when i say that you might think that this is some sort of gimmick to convince you to do something but this is basically how the world goes round since aristotle but before we get into that you need to know that people's worldview can vary tremendously <clears throat> And the way your audience or members of your audience see the world is crucial to understanding how you can work with those modes of persuasion. Because if people are biased about topics that you're going to tackle, you will need to use the structure of a story and also the importance of an idea to show them that there's much more to your topic than meets the eye. Uh, when I show you this picture, picture of man in an airplane, or on an airplane um, wearing these Pakistani scarves how does your worldview react when you see the image of men wearing Pakistani scarves the way you see people when you first look at them this is really important it's related to the credibility of that person under your scrutiny let's watch a video what do you think when you look at me a woman of faith an expert maybe even a sister, or oppressed, brainwashed, a terrorist. Well, this shows us that whenever we see a presenter, whenever we meet a new person, we're always going to face the three pillars of public speaking. They all relate to the rhetorical triangle, ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos is the ethical appeal, but ethos isn't only about right and wrong. As a teacher, your ethos is your character, your credibility, as a leader of a classroom. Within the first hour, your students should know why you're an authority figure and how you're qualified to teach them the material, explaining your educational background, your work history, all of the other relevant information will help the students to trust you and trust is absolutely foundational for learning right i want my students to know not only my credibility but also my character this me this means i explain my value system right up front the most important classroom value for me is that all students feel that they are amazing people they're very special they're treated with respect and love from both me and their fellow classmates in my classroom, my goal is to create a warm, friendly, nurturing environment for every student to feel important. I know it sounds corny, but establishing this role is very important because it breaks down many barriers. It really lets my precious students be who they are. Just, just be you. Be natural. You don't have to worry about judgment from me. You don't have to worry about judgment from your fellow classmates. Okay? that leads us to pathos and pathos is the most important appeal on the first day of a new class pathos is the emotional appeal so this is all about making your audience right your students feel feelings 
if you logically go through the syllabus but you don't infuse bits of you into the course you are just a robot and the only thing that students take away from your boring first lesson is that you can read policies and rules in a monotone voice this is no way to create a relationship or a first impression when I was a brand new teacher in 1999 I was I was always concerned with being overly professional right because I was only 17 I realize now that I can be exactly who I am in real life and this is me it's much more natural it allows me to connect with students so who am I I'm fun I like to laugh I like knowledge right I'm curious but I think you can only learn if you feel connected to the material and I love storytelling and I think infusing bits of yourself into lecture helps students see and feel your passion for the subject and get to know and trust you a little more so that helps I mean this pathos will help you with your ethos and by the end of the first day my students know that I absolutely love every single second of my job and being with them this is important in creating that passion generating those positive emotions to set the tone for the remainder of the course well let me give you four class suggestions that are based on ethos pathos and logos first thing just greet every single student as they come in the door you know everyone will get a good morning everyone will get a hey how's it going hey y'all how you doing if possible just let some music play just play some upbeat some fun music you know like that sensation when you go to a store to a, um, an apparel store you know when you hear music in the background you know this feels good you know you get there so try to do that with try to do that with your audience with your students smile just be you take a deep breath I mean it's, it's the most fulfilling job in the world you're your mentor your facilitator of knowledge okay you're not a boring robot and if you are a boring robot you definitely shouldn't be a teacher so tend to each one of these appeals devote time to developing the logic of your message use emotion to humanize your logic and show your audience you are you're worth listening to logos well logos is the logical appeal on the first day of a new course students want to know why in the world they're sitting in the classroom and as an instructor it should be your goal to explain how the course logically fits into the whole of your um, students education and in their lives but logos applies to more than just the desire to know why the logical appeal also refers to the structure and the organization of the course so it's about cohesion and coherence students require this sense of order from the very first sentence you speak to them and this creates not only a hierarchy in the classroom but also <clears throat> the way in which the class will run throughout the time you're together so these facts and figures rules and policies they will help your students feel the order the structure and the organization that they need to be able to learn uh, that they have to use in order to understand the materials right the course book or the authentic materials that you're working with them the ones that you must use to teach them well I have an example for you a, a lot of people deem this speech as one of the best speeches ever given which is the I have a dream speech by Martin Luther King um, we're gonna have a look at maybe you know some of the reasons why it is so memorable well definitely it's got some soaring rhetoric right it definitely stands out his speech was well researched right uh, it's a work of poetry it bursts with imagery um, he's got rhythm frequent repetition alliteration um, he's obviously fighting racial injustice he is denouncing that seething American nightmare uh, that they were facing back then it calls for action that's for sure 
he uses a lot of this mantra of now is the time, right? He dreams of a better and fairer future. Uh, it was a very fervent emotional sermon, that's for sure. It was forced out of that language and that spirit of democracy, thanks to Martin Luther King's mastery of the spoken word and his argument coherence. Argument coherence. If we think of argument, for example, as the um, Star Trek's Enterprise ship, we could use those three heroes uh, from the show they could be seen as our pillars of persuasion so we could have bones as our ethos thanks to his ethical views right and his demeanor captain kirk would be pathos his all about feelings and we can link him to the emotional effect to the emotional effect of speaker's words and finally obviously spock would be logos due to his being fond of being fond of evidence logic and arrangement okay this is just for us to illustrate better the three pillars of rhetoric but we do learn three lessons from those three pillars right from that triangle you can improve your ethos how do you do that through shared experience you can say well you and i as teachers we've been through this and that or you can say i know how you feel and I've been there, right? This is all about shared experience. This helps your ethos. And you can improve pathos by showing you care. You can try to elicit emotions. You can use metaphors because we all think in metaphor. So bring a vivid example, work with imagery, generate compassion through shared feelings. You can improve logos by visualizing evidence. You can use graphs, quotes, surveys. You can lay them out nicely on the slides, working with the flow of information, right? So think visually. Well, since we're talking about logos, let's focus on presenting evidence, working with data. It's absolutely crucial that any data in your presentation carries with this data a clear message. Okay, and you can keep that message by remembering this one fact. Data slides or data or data, whatever, how you pronounce it, but data slides, they're not really about the data. They are about the meaning of the data. What is, what is being conveyed, okay? So most presenters, they don't really understand this distinction. How many times have you sat through presentations where the speaker referred to one complicated chart for five minutes, after which you still couldn't figure out the point of the slide, you know? Is it about numbers? So bear in mind, it is about the meaning, not about the numbers. Finally, I give you four secrets to great public speaking. Well, number one, you should focus on one major idea. Here, the idea is that the power to convey an idea is what really matters, right? It's the focus on the idea itself and using the structure of a story through pillars of persuasion, through um, six ways to hook your audience, but everything orbits the major idea mantra, okay? Motto, if you will. So the focus is that every idea can only be promoted through storytelling and every presentation contains those elements orbited by the three modes of persuasion so pick one idea and make it the through line of your entire presentation everything you say will link back to your main thing in some way so that's my first tip and my second one is give your listeners a reason to care they have to welcome you into their world. How can you do that? You need to use a very important topic and tool, which is curiosity for people who don't share your views. You need to reveal a disconnection into their worldview so that can allow you in. So you need to reveal this disconnection into their worldview. That way they're gonna be like, oh, okay, there's a gap here. You need to bridge that knowledge gap. They that's the only way that a person who's not agreeing with you 
they might maybe perhaps consider some of your some of your arguments um, let me give you my third tip which is build your idea piece by piece just out of concept your audience already understands use the power of language use the power of metaphor to weave together these concepts that already exist in everyone's minds it's the audience's language it's their language it's not yours try to refrain from too much meta language use too much of the jargon um, so before mentioning the word ethos introduce the topic referring to the credibility of the speaker to the appeal don't don't use these words don't go there if it's not going to help you because like i said it's all about your ethos and your pathos right so everything you say and everything you present people are going to be thinking well is this person credible do I trust him oh okay and when I'm when I think this person is credible that's actually his ethos well wow, that's cool so these associations they're gonna happen naturally don't try to force them and why are metaphors so cool well because they reveal the desired shape of the pattern Imagine yourself, for example, talking about abstract concepts such as grammar and some uh, sentences and logical um, arguments and all of that. Try to make it vivid, right? Try to use a visual way to present these things and using metaphor to help students understand it better. So don't take it for granted the fact that there it is going to help you. Use it from now on. Like I said, let me give you an example. For example, Princess uh, Diana's brother, when he was giving the eulogy, right? He, he actually used a spot-on example of metaphor with the concept that the audience already understood. And that would definitely help to establish pathos. And he wasn't maybe thinking about it, but it, it is the way it is, you know, you entice, you draw emotions from people by things you say and how you say it and how they see you. And this leads us to the fourth tip, right? I mean, we are constantly talking about the fact that the idea is what really matters because once we have the idea, then we can work on everything else. So make your idea worth sharing, right? Ask yourself, who does this idea benefit be honest with the answer it's, if it's all about you then it won't be worth it right I mean it won't be worth sharing your idea but if you feel that there's a potential there if you feel that it can be inspirational uh, then you have the key the key ingredient to a great talk a talk that will be a great benefit to students and teachers to everyone Thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope to see you next time. Feel free to ask any questions. Feel free to contact me. Thank you. Goodbye. See you next time.